Welcome to Expera Marketing, the podcast where we innovate, create, and appreciate. Powered by Mostly Automotive Marketing with Matt Wilson. Here's the host of Expera Marketing, Chief Expera Marketer, Colin Karras Grillo. Ladies and gentlemen, Expera Marketers of all ages, we are back. It is Expera Marketing. We had a brief hiatus. Atis because of my partner in crime. Let's bring him right on, Matt Wilson. For all of those who are viewing, can see that Matt has a new accessory, and it's in the form of a sling. Yeah, you like and it. So, so Matt, I like your sling, but Thank I you. mean, is this a fashion thing or what's going on here? Let our let our viewers and listeners know what happened. Where have you been? Well, it is a fashion thing. It matches my hat, <laughs> and I'm going to get the Nike logo embroidered on the sling. I think I was there you in. Go. A, Doing a little mountain biking and, uh, you know, maybe riding above my skill level and did a header over the handlebars and landed oh. on my shoulder. And I uh, displaced, fractured my collarbone, and it did not feel good. So, Holy smokes. Well, we're, we're glad to see you're okay and that you're still Xperia marketing, even with yes. your, spl- your slang. So, so thank you for that. Uh, but yeah, today is a really, really great episode. Not only, you know, this brief hiatus, but coming back, I think we have more momentum uh, than we've ever had before because we're going to be talking about exactly what's going on in the space today, the automotive space. And that's what happens online, offline, and everything in between. This is Xperia Marketing episode 24 with that same title, online, offline, and everything in between. And I'd also like to thank our hosts, our sponsors, Dealer Marketing Magazine, dealermarketing.com. You can go check out all of the wealth of information that they have on the site. They have expertly curated all of these different individuals from the automotive space, the technology side of things, software, service, et cetera, to give you dealers, advertisers, listeners, a place to go to get information about what's going on in the space, the next best thing, best practices, so on and so forth. You think I covered it all, Matt? Is that good? Yeah, I think you got it. So without further ado, then let's get down to business. What we're going to be focusing on today is an article written by a gentleman who, and we were just talking about this, has more experience in the space than you and I combined, which means we're going to have a very, very informative episode today. But this gentleman is Greg Ross. He's a car practice manager and senior partner at Motor Minds, Inc., He started with GM back in the day and pioneered their OnStar platform. But like I said, bringing with us or to us a wealth of information. And there he is. How are you, Greg? How's it going? I'm doing great. How are you all doing today? We're hanging in there. And Matt, uh, you feeling any residual pain? Are you okay? I'm feeling good. I'm ready to go. I just just hope your bike came with OnStar. Give it my (laughs) But you got a call and they're able to get you immediate help. Push that button and push that OnStar button. Got ski patrol up to me. All good. (laughs) So I love it. Well, Greg, thank you for coming on. And yes, I know we had this brief hiatus. We had to reschedule a couple times, but here we are. And as I say, all good things take time. So without further ado, please introduce yourself. Tell our listeners and viewers what makes you you. All right. Uh, Happy to. Yeah, my name is Greg Ross. I am a connected car practice manager for for, uh, Motor Minds. Motor Minds is a a group of automotive veterans like me, uh, people from all over the industry with a lot of deep experience. And I'm the guy that focuses on all things connected car. And because I spent a good part of my time, I was at GM for 30 plus years, as you mentioned, but about half of that was being part of the leadership team that built the OnStar business. So very deeply familiar with what you can do when you connect into a car and you can get those great, great data connections and ability to deliver services to customers remotely. And what's exciting about connected space now is that it's it's really not just limited to GM and a few other luxury brands. This is something that pretty much every new car is coming out with. It's got a built-in connection, a built-in ability to connect to the internet and communicate through the cellular network. And that's creating opportunities for a whole lot of innovation it's creating a lot more data and there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in the space. And so part of my mission with working with Dealer Marketing Magazine is to try to raise dealer awareness of some of the cool things going on in that space and uh, make them aware of what, what some of the possibilities are. And if they're not immediately there, what's going to very soon be available to them uh, at the dealerships. I think that's exceptionally important. And thank you for that introduction. I mean, we see that this space 
let's mm-hmm. let's even talk about the past year, right? Year yeah. and a half with with the COVID nineteen pandemic. This is a space that now has evolved or has sped up in terms of the evolution, right? With with right. everything you're talking about and that connected car experience and utilizing that for shopping data and all these different things that I personally find fascinating because it's what informs you know our, our marketing spends and things like that from the advertising perspective. So I right. think it's really fascinating. I'm very excited to have you here today. So let's just jump into this. I mean, you, you provided an article to Dealer Marketing uh, Magazine, dealermarketing.com, uh, using data to connect online and in-person car shopping. And one of the things I'm going to read here is just some data, right? So it's two points that are addressed in the article that you provided. But basically, customer behavior already shows that the uh, want for an online shopping experience, right? So let's just preface it with that. A 2021 study by Deloitte, only 17% of U.S. customers said they wanted their uh, shopping experience to be fully virtual, which means that there is that connected experience, right? Between online and offline, which is why we're talking about it in this episode. And then in a Google study, which was 2017, 95% of shoppers researched their purchases online before an in-person visit. And most car shoppers expect to use a hybrid approach, combining online data gathering what an in-person experience, uh, excuse me, data, online data gathering with an in-person experience with the car or truck they are considering. So right. for us, what that means is here comes the COVID-19 pandemic. Dealers adopted digital retailing, which essentially there were three options you could provide. It's the fully virtual experience, which we're only right. seeing that 17% of customers would want the hybrid approach. They start their deal online and then come finish their deal at the dealership, which seems right. to be the most popular approach. And then ultimately the third one is the standard traditional, you know, buyer just comes to the dealership, doesn't really do anything online. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about digital retailing and let's talk about the hybrid approach uh, and that consumer shopping behavior. So I'd already mentioned kind of COVID-19 and that uh, escalating the adoption for dealers, but what right. else have you guys seen? I mean, in, in the in, in term or, you know, in the meantime? Well, I think we've seen a lot of, you know, obviously there was immediate innovation. People right. had to innovate quickly, uh, whether they were ready to or not because of COVID. And then I think that's continued with the chip shortage. Uh, people have had to innovate more to, to get more out of every, every opportunity that they see. Um, but what I was trying to point to with the article is that even though it's it's a reality that customers are going to be doing some shopping online, customers aren't particularly satisfied with the solutions that they mm. have yet. Um, they they're doing a lot of work, um, frankly, to to research and investigate vehicles ahead of what you know they used to do by by traveling from store to store. Um, but then when they get to the store, the store is not particularly prepared uh, to receive them because the store doesn't know much about what the customer's online shopping experience has been. So. Some of what I was really trying to point to is the disconnect that why can't we take the data from the customer shopping experience and make it easy for the dealer to be aware of what are people shopping for in my particular region? What are people looking at? What kind of accessories are they trying out? What are, what kind of pricing are they looking at? What kind of trims are they looking at to help me understand, do I have the right inventory in place? Do I have the right vehicles and demo service? Are my people trained properly to know who's likely to show up and what they're cross shopping? All that data is is created during the shopping process and exists in the online shopping process. But I think there's a disconnect and the customers reported that too in the in the studies that, that you mentioned, that when they got to the store, they felt like the people they talked to weren't particularly well informed relative to the research that they'd done, that they were disappointed with the inventory that they had available relative to what their online search led them to expect. And so it's a significant dis, uh, disconnect that I think we need to work, work harder to, to close. I've been shopping for a car, Greg, for about, I don't know, maybe a week and a half. And the disconnect starts even before the going to the dealership. Like you, you know, you're online, you're going through the website, you click this, you fill this out, you do that. And then the person who contacts you asks you a question that's out of left field from what you've already been doing. And, right. you know, it's like, like they don't look and go, oh, I saw you inquired about this and you fill this out. You know, let me answer your question. It's they ask a different question. They reach out, totally disconnected from the experience that I've had so far. And, yeah. you know, I try and step back and look at it as somebody outside automotive, which is hard as you try. It's hard to do that <laughs> being what we do. Um, you know, so I feel like I'm hypercritical of those things. But right. to me, like as an average consumer, like I asked a question, don't contact me and then ask me a question. Answer the question that I asked you. But there's a yeah. for sure disconnect. And that's even before I walk in the showroom. 
totally right. agree. So, and it's it's not um, it's not by way of pointing fingers that you know the dealers are doing something wrong necessarily. It's just I think it's a disconnect that that the data is not being made available to the dealers in a timely way. Right. Customers not really being offered a good opportunity to pre uh, to send the data to the dealer ahead of time to to help uh, short circuit some of that disconnect. So, I just I, it's a it's a miss on the part of both the OEM shopping sites uh, where significant amount of the shopping is done. But also the uh, the independent independent sites. I think there's opportunities to close those gaps too. Absolutely. So I mean, for us, you know, we look at it, and and it's funny that you bring this up because it still is a, a very big pain point in the industry and an opportunity for improvement on the dealer and OEM side of things. I could not agree with you more. But you know, Matt and I first got connected because of a very similar theme to an article that I had wrote on uh, on. LinkedIn, which is basically mm. from from click to brick, right? And mm. it's providing that Amazon -esque experience right. to a customer. Um, but what we see or one of the pain points that I identified is similar to what you're saying is basically by providing all of these uh, widgets and doodads, if you will, digital retailing, for example, doodads, I like doodads it. right? So yeah, we have digital term. retailing, which essentially should make the customer's experience easier or it caters to what they want, which is starting their deal online, right? Picking out a right. vehicle, coming up with terms or financing options, valuing their trade, and then ultimately packaging that information up and coming to the dealership to finish their transaction. But what we saw or what I saw at least, and I think many people saw it, maybe I was just the one that said, no, we got to figure this out, is yeah. essentially by providing those tools, which would make the experience frictionless and seamless, we actually created more friction on the dealer side of things because now a customer said, hey, I did all of this online. And when they finally showed up to the dealership, the dealership process wasn't in place. And the customer essentially was starting from stage one, which right. obviously created a lot of frustrations for them. So it's just very funny. I mean, coming full circle that this is how Matt and I kind of initially connected. And, and now we're talking about it again. Well, but, and I come from it from knowing what's possible. Yeah. I, I, I The last uh, car I bought, I bought a, a pickup. Uh, Chevy pickup and um, and I went through a lot of work to figure out exactly which one I wanted um, and when I went to go find it at a store none of the stores were interested in the work that I'd done already <laughs> it's like yeah. well we'll sell you what we have well and it's not what I wanted I mean I, I spent the time searching for it for a reason so and then when I went to order it um, you know I know that um, there's an ability for the car to tell me how mm -hmm. it's coming along the car is connected from the time it's Time it's produced. So rather than calling the dealer to ask when's my ordered car gonna, or truck going to get here, I know that the truck could have been sending me updates to say, "Hey, I was I was activated today. I came. I left the factory today. Hey, I'm at the rail yard. You know, I'm going to be at the dealership within a couple of days." The car has all that information and its ability to is able to produce that, as well so, as send me a clean diagnostic report that you know I was born today and all my diagnostics are good. I think that's an opportunity for a delighter along the lines of what you're talking about with a, an Amazon type experience. Right. That so who, who's onus? Process. I mean, whose onus does that fall under? Is that the OEM that should be doing that or customers? Should they ask for it? I mean, I, I wasn't even aware unless yeah. I'd like to say, hey, I'm in the space, so I know everything. I don't. But <laughs> ultimately, I mean, is that can a customer say, hey, I want these kind of updates and then a dealer can provide uh or have the vehicle provide those updates? This is fascinating to me. So how does that yeah. work? Out? <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's it, nobody's doing it today, as far right. as I know. Okay. Um, uh, it's done actually for some fleets. Some fleets actually have made some demands like that. Uh, fleets obviously are very concerned about when this when my truck going to get here because I've got work to do and a day matters, or when's it going to get to an upfitter or whatever else they need to do. So a couple of OEMs have actually started to provide uh, those kind of logistics feeds to tell fleets when their vehicles are going to be there. Um, Domin but dealers don't yet have that that capability. Domino's figured it out. Domino's can tell yeah. you when the pizza is <laughs> in the oven and when it's out of the oven and when it's being inspected. Like, let's get on. But, I, you know, that's a good question, Colin, though, because like even even going back, like it, to me, it's a technology thing. Like, right. Right, it's not the dealer's fault. It's it's, yeah. it's I don't know whose fault it is. I don't think we need to blame anybody. But I think more of it is who can fix it. That's the thing. Well, the, the good news is the capabilities there, are there. So yeah. what you need is you need an ability for the car to communicate. That's what they can all do now, um, yep. and you need you need to do some some work to develop those kinds of applications, like a you know tell me about my ordered vehicle in the pipeline thing, or tell the dealer about the ordered vehicles in the pipeline, or give the dealer a, a notice when the vehicle's on the lot, 
or give the dealer an ability to know where the vehicle is on the lot. All that yeah, stuff is, is possible. Um, and some of it comes down to, I think, you know, fleets are concentrated enough to where their voice is pretty clear and, and has a lot of influence at the OEMs. I think dealers are partly dispersed and there's lots of them and partly, you know, haven't consolidated around some key, key requests or aren't always familiar with the kinds of things that they should be asking for, which is part of my purpose is <laughs> trying to make them more aware of what you should expect as a dealer. You should expect well, that all the cars on your lot, at least the new ones are active and providing you data and helping you manage your store. Right. Now, I mean, if we could get the dealership community to band together and, and get something or request something that you're you're discussing here, I think that's an absolute game changer because now they could better. Oh, yeah, be responsive when there's a clear voice from the dealer. Right. Says, this right. is what I want. This is what I want to do. That's beautiful. No, good. So we're, we're glad you're uh, the messenger on, on the platform here. So uh, let's talk about, take a couple steps back, because now that we know that there's so many capabilities out there with the technology, let's talk about just some of the pain points, right? So I had already addressed sure. uh, the disconnect, just as we discussed before, this, you know, providing the Amazon-esque experience, letting a customer do something online and then not being aware or being able to facilitate what they conducted online at the store. So right, continuing that purchase process, you had mentioned the same thing. What other pain points? I mean, right now, let's talk about it. It's it's everyone knows about it. Inventory. So let's let's talk about that. Well, inventory, uh, you know, is is there and it's not always active. So one of the things that is a possibility or an opportunity would be to use the connected capabilities to manage your inventory. So to know where it is, uh, you shouldn't have to do physical audits where you walk around and count vehicles. You should be able to ping every vehicle and just ask, is it is it where it's supposed to be? and then go chase the fewer that are an exception that aren't where they're supposed to be, uh, meaning they're not within the, the, the lot. You know, those kinds of things are simple, uh, easy, to, easy to do things technically that are pain points that, you know, dealers should be benefiting from. Uh, dealers should be getting information and diagnostics about, about vehicles on the lot and as to whether any of them have low tire pressure or need an oil change or have a diagnostic code and, and get those addressed before they get demoed or, or delivered to a customer or when they get off the truck, uh, those are opportunities. Um, vehicles should be much, much better connected to do service reminders and service uh, service notifications back to the dealership. Most OEMs are starting to have programs like that, but one of the major pain points is uh, activation is is really spotty. Uh, some some uh, dealers and some OEMs are very, very good at it. They get 99% plus of customers out the door with an activation live. Others are much, much lower than that, meaning You've got customers out there with potential services like automated service reminders that aren't turned on because mm -hmm. because the process didn't didn't get executed well at the time of delivery. So there's lots and lots of pain points like that that I think are create potential for extra value within the dealership that uh, are under underdeveloped. So then dealer personnel, let's let's just talk about it from there. So you talk about individuals or at dealerships where a dealership sells a vehicle. The personnel uh, does not activate these alerts, things like that. So, I mean, obviously another pain point, are there ways that dealers can go about, uh, you know, fixing that opportunity, if you will, right? Or that pain point, I mean, sure, training and putting a process in place. I mean, what else would you see? Yeah, a lot of it is really just execution and training uh -huh. and follow through. I, I Sometimes I think it's a matter of not being really clear about what the value of those connections are. That. That service reminder, for example, uh, from my experience, dramatically improves the probability that a customer is going to come back because compare getting a postcard that may or may not show up at the right time telling you that you've got an opportunity for an oil change versus an email from your manufacturer that says, mm -hmm. we know your vehicle needs an update and the manufacturer recommends it happens. I can tell you the response rate is dramatically higher for that, uh, for the automated response. And then the other thing is we also know the customers that come back for service are more likely to repeat purchase sure. their next vehicle. So it's it's in the dealer's interest to do it. I think part of it is it's still kind of new and, and right. not every every dealership is fully familiar with what they're trying to do here. Well, I think you see a lot of OEMs. I mean, for example, we have three Stellantis stores, right? So Jeep, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram. I mean, they are making yeah. a massive push towards customer experience, which many OEMs are. Uh, and that is, I mean, essentially the, the next competitive battleground. If not, it is already. And a right. lot of this does fall into exactly what you're trying to convey to the dealer community, which is you need to have a process in place that's going to impact the biggest thing moving forward, which is one, your customer experience 
points, but your retention. And why not maintain the customer, which you've already sold the vehicle to that is servicing at your dealership that's loyal to you? I mean, not only does it, as you're saying, will they be repeat purchasers most likely, but they actually studies show that they're spending more money in your uh, service base on your fixed right. op side of things when you do keep that customer and over the lifetime of the customer. So I think that that's exceptionally important. And if dealers listening can get one thing out of this, it's, it's yes, it's needs, they need to be aware of that process that needs to be in place to ensure that, hey, these service reminders are set up or activated, depending on the OEM and what you represent. But I think a majority of OEMs have things like that in place. Right. I mean, correct? <laughs> they do. Uh, they didn't used to, and that's part yeah. of the reason for the uneven performance. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was something that was unique to some make some makes, but now it's everybody's doing it. Uh, everybody's got a device on the car. And I think the dealers just aren't always clear what the connection is back to them. You know, how does this help me? But I think of it as if you don't have the vehicle leave with a connection on, you're, you're missing an opportunity to stay connected with the customer in a way that you just can't duplicate any other way um, right. to know how that car is being driven, how it's doing mechanically. And I think the other gap back to uh, OEMs and dealers having right. better communication is there's not enough data coming back to the dealer about how those vehicles are performing in the field. And that, that should be out there too, you know. Wow. So, I mean, is that as simple as, like you said, if there's a unified voice from the dealer community saying that they want this data, I mean, do you think that that's a possibility that an OEM would say, all right, here, we'll surrender the data? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's just to be uh, always cautious about making sure you're clear on customer consent. Yeah. But, but usually what the OEMs get consent for is an ability to give at least anonymized data mm -hmm. uh, to third parties. And, and OEMs are sending that data on to companies that are using it to inform parking decisions and road planning decisions and so forth that already exists today. There's no reason that shouldn't be coming back to a dealer that says, once somebody buys a new F-150, how do different people use them? You know, how many miles do they typically drive? Do they, you know, do they store them in different times of the year? How much do they tow? That kind of data is available off the vehicle. The product planners at the OEM are using that data to make the next generation F-150 and get insights around how those vehicles are used. There's no reason that the people selling those cars shouldn't be getting that information too to say, hey, these are the accessories that once people They're take most delivery, yep. they most often not only yep. have, but the most often use. Because the OEM can tell, did these accessories get turned on or not? Were they ever activated? Did anybody ever play with these features? Um, and how did they use them? That data is fantastic insight for product development, but it's also a good insight for training and education of salespeople. Yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately, when you look at it that way, and we talk about providing this Amazon-esque experience, right? I mean, one of the biggest things that- That's what that Amazon you can, knows, right? Right. Here, here's here's, here's right. something, you know, someone who bought this, bought this, or here's your suggested product, or here's your act, uh, added right. recommended add-on, you know, things like that. And I think that's definitely how I see the space developing is leveraging more of this technology, or at least hopefully getting access to it or the data, I should say, where then you can take that you can make a formulated decision based upon, okay, here's what's going on in the market, right? Just like historical data for marketing. You look at, all right, spends and trends and all these different things. That's absolutely crucial. So I'm on board. I'm right there with you. Well, that in the next skill. cycle, do something like Amazon does to say, with your permission, would you mind us letting us look at how you've used the last vehicle you've had mm -hmm. so we can make better recommendations for the next vehicle that you're looking for. Yep. So it's again, hyper, you gotta be sensitive. You gotta get, you gotta give customers a reason to do it. <laughs> yeah. But we're all doing Amazon prime uh, right. and we're all surrendering an awful lot of data, but there is a benefit to it. No, absolutely. More, absolutely. More I'm mean. a, I'm a big believer. I mean, like you said, it's, if you are asking and they give consent and then it becomes this hyper personalized experience, you know, I've, I've talked to Matt about it numerous times, but I'm a big believer in the philosophy that an individual like, right. So when you're advertising to someone, all dealers are going towards that lowest funnel shopper, right? They're all sure. concerned about that cost per lead and how many sales did this, you know, ad get me and so on and so forth. But I believe that it might be beneficial for dealers or behoove dealers to go a little higher up the funnel and based upon person's lifestyle interests, right? Like Mike or Matt, geez, Mike, sorry, Matt. <laughs> yeah. You've been gone for so long. I call you the wrong name. Uh, no, but you know, like Matt is a, I was going to think of bike. See? So because Matt right. is an avid mountain biker, essentially, you know, Matt's data, Matt, mountain bikes, he enjoys the outdoors, you know, he has children, all these different things. Now you're utilizing that data to inform 
your advertising and marketing messaging. So now when I serve an ad to Matt, because I know he's in the market for a Jeep Gladiator, I can say, Jeep Gladiator, complete with roof rack for your mountain bike and cargo space for your children's, you know, X, Y, and Z. Now sure. the messaging becomes super relevant and essentially a customer goes, oh my goodness, this vehicle is made for me because it's exactly tailored to their lifestyles. I mean, that's the evolution that, I mean, is that what you're seeing essentially or proposing the evolution? Yeah, ideally. I mean, yeah. that's, that's really what people are that, that's yeah. what the rest of their life is causing them to expect, right? right? That's that's how my experience works in all the rest of my life. Why doesn't it work that way in my automotive right. life? And that's that's really the idea. I don't think we're talking about introducing things that people have never seen before. Sure. Uh, we're talking about meeting their expectations. It. <laughs> that's really what a lot of those those research things said is people are already using online resources to shop and they expect that process to complete itself all the way through. So, okay, this is very interesting because, uh, I mean, very recent occurrence, but let's talk about, for example, Stellantis. So they had um, basically proposed that dealers utilize their digital retailing vendor, and we'll okay. leave all names out of it, aside from everyone knows Stellantis now. Uh, but essentially, there was a lot of pushback from the dealer community because they thought they were being strong-armed to utilize this one specific vendor and that turned out not to be the case at all. But what Stellantis was trying to do or is trying to do is have that consistency from tier one all the way down to tier three, which I think is very, very important and valuable. I mean, for dealers that are pushing back, right? Maybe we can change their minds, Greg, because I know that's why you're here is to kind of educate, bring, you know, bring awareness. Isn't there more value to having that consistent experience from tier one, as you uh, mentioned, people shopping on the manufacturer site down to the, your tier three site? Well, I think you need to, I need, the ideal is you show it with data. You show that you show that it works. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've had some experience like that. The thing I mentioned with the service service reminders, sure. um, we were able to show the dealers that if, if you get people signed up, you're going to see more service business. And, and here's the proof. And, it's logical on its face anyway, but when you have the proof that shows that the customer's expectations are being met better, they have higher trust, they have higher satisfaction and more repeat purchases, you know, why not? And, you know, that's, that's what it takes to build that trust. And I do know that, you know, we've all been around the industry long enough that there's not always a uh, full trust between the manufacturer right. and the dealers. And I understand that kind of pushback that you're talking about, but in the end, it should come back to not who's winning between those two parties, but, is this really going to be more effective from the customer's right. perspective? And I think the customer is telling you, I'm not satisfied with the way the shopping experience works. I also don't think they're fully satisfied with the way the service experience works. And you could use data to have a better and more complete and more predictable service experience. And so it, it's, I think it's a matter of, of uh, putting it together in a way that people can really see how the customers are benefiting. Right. So more customer first or it's customer focused, which is what we are seeing. Definitely a migration towards that. But it's a two way street, as you mentioned. So there's pushback sure. from the dealer community to the OEM. And sure. then as a result, OEMs, you know, I'm sure get frustrated. And then that's when they kind of put out these different ways of doing business that the dealers have to uh, abide to or abide by. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, it's yeah, like you said, it's not about who's winning. It's how do we work together? to ensure that the customer experience or what's best for the customer is happening. That's the dialogue I'd love to see is more of a start, start fresh to say, what do you think the customer really wants? And mm -hmm. I think what you, what you could say is it's pretty clear that from the data, what the customer really wants. And it's also pretty clear from all of our shopping experiences outside of automotive, what the customer really wants They expect to be able to use data at their discretion to make their shopping experience more complete. And they expect to be known, when they want to be known and have their preferences be known so that their time isn't wasted um, they expect things to be efficient and i think all of connecting the data to make all that happen is what's essential to meet the customer's needs right so here's another interesting one and, and kind of off our little uh you know layout here outline but you look at all of these different uh platforms so let's say for example you know where people would be advertising so facebook and instagram obviously you know owning uh well facebook owning yeah. instagram but you know then uh google and youtube and snapchat and all these other platforms that dealers might you know consider advertising on or currently advertising on when they become their own walled gardens which essentially that's what they are 
now. So the, the goal is to be, and we said this on a previous episode, the goal is to be invited to each garden party mm -hmm. because now they're their own ecosystems. How difficult, or do you foresee that being difficult then for dealers, OEMs, and then these platforms, because they're all walling themselves off. So essentially, how is that data going to be shared or it won't be shared? I mean, do you see that as a, as a roadblock, a potential hurdle that we'd have to overcome? Yeah, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, fully following what you're, what you're, what, what I'm saying. putting out there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess it, that, that, that each of those ecosystems kind of has its own environment, but in the right. end, the data is not worth anything unless it can connect to an outcome. And so in the case of the car business, the outcome is somebody's getting sales or service. Selling a car, uh, right, and so their vehicle. Ultimately the data has got to come to, come to the store. And in the end, the customer does want to go to a store to buy the car. That's right. what most people want to do. And so I, I think the demand is there to say, you know, even if you have a wall garden, whether you begin your shopping experience in the Google environment or the Facebook, Instagram environment or on the OEM site or whatever, it's all going to be more effective and more complete if you can connect it to, to the in-person experience once, yes. you, once you get down to it. Now, see, and I, I, I do think there's that, that, that need for the dealer to be more, to have a more consolidated voice. And I'm not sure the best way to do that, whether that's through some large dealer groups or through NADA or some other way to do it. But I think the dealers are lacking a vision to say, well, what do we want? What do we think we should be able to do for our customers? Um, and what data do we demand? Kind of like the fleets are doing, like I mentioned, uh, in order to fulfill what we want to do. And I don't, I don't see a, a clearly stated vision for that yet. And I think that's part of what, um, is needed. What needs to emerge, yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, Matt and I had discussed in the past with uh, with another expert panelist, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, Alana from Auto Lead Star. We mm -hmm. talked about creating a uh, what was it, Matt? The forum or yeah. <laughs> the committee? Mm -hmm. Yes, the well, committee. Like, the committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we come up with all these definitions, and we uh, we're a united front. We all talk in the same language. Well, that's it. But I think maybe that's what's needed in representation uh, from the geeks, if you will, not to call you guys geeks, but I mean, we're the data people in and, and, right. and this space. It is so important. I mean, the geeks are, are running this space. And so the, the fact of the matter is, you know, I think, Greg, that absolutely it's great that we're talking about it on, on the podcast because there is there's a need for that united front where dealers yep. need to say, well, how does all of this data, how can I utilize this data? How can I connect the experience from what's occurring on tier one, down to tier two, down to tier three, across all of my different marketing ecosystems and things like that? So yes, they need to know to ask for that connectivity. I think that's right. And it's a, it's a two-way dialogue. Part of it is they need to be more aware of what's possible, mm -hmm. which is what the geeks like I like <laughs> myself can, can help with. But you know, I'm not I'm not the guy running the store every day, and so those sure. people that are running the store need to be more familiar with. Well, if I could if I could have that data, or if I could solve that problem, that would be great. And then help with the with some sort of prioritized set of requirements back to the OEMs to say this is what I really need to run my store better, and it's going to make me more efficient and make the customers happy and make everybody have move more more quickly and take cost out of the system. It's and all just a matter of priorities. Um, that's, that's what we want. <laughs> that's, right. that's what we want. Take cut costs out of the system, right? If it helps the dealer become more efficient and save money there, boom, that's a win. If they sell more cars, that's a win. If the customer's happier with customer satisfaction, they're providing uh, great surveys and positive reviews on, on Google and all of the other you know digital spaces they can go, that's a win. And we just want- Oh, well, we know the customers <laughs> Customers have reported their pain, pain points over and over again. And right. Things take too, take too long. People aren't- well enough informed and didn't find the inventory I was looking for those those kinds of things are pretty pretty well known it's but what hasn't happened I don't think is a focused effort to say well how are you going to apply some of these new technologies to make a big move against that especially what's what's brand new to be fair is it doesn't it wasn't true until very recently that basically every car on, on the lot is is connected at least right. every new one right so now that you have that as a given what what can you do that's new and there's there's quite a lot I think and it it'll require a focused dealer dealer voice on that. So what do you foresee? I'm going to ask you to uh, pull out your crystal ball. Mm. And what do you foresee happening? I mean, let's say in the next five, 10, you know, 15 years in the space is something like the connected, you know, 
car connectivity. Uh, do you see that becoming much more prevalent in the space? I mean, once dealers get educated on it, do you see that as being crucial to dealer operations? I mean, it sounds like it absolutely would be. And yeah. it's not just about inventory management. It's about customer experience and customer retention and, you know, operations internally for a process to educate yeah. salespeople. Excuse me. So, yes, tell, walk us through that. What do you foresee? My yeah. So, I mean, it, the vision is, you know, if you're if you're a dealer and, and you sell a connected car, to a customer, you stay connected with that customer for the life of that vehicle and then on into the next one. And so what does that translate into? That means that uh, that customer is always wired into your service department. And so you don't need to wait for that customer to call. You call them to say, hey, you're you're approaching your service needs. Let us schedule you in. You you call based on when you have the most capacity uh, and you 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 can anticipate that because you know when your fleet of vehicles are out there, when they're going to need service and you bring that customer in at a convenient time for them and for you. So that it's more efficient. Um, you can, you can uh, manage when services are done and where services are done because the customers allow you to be aware of what's most convenient for them, whether they want to get something picked up near work or near home uh, to get services done. You're able to do data-based insurance and finance products because you're connected with a vehicle you can do a, an adjustable lease that adjusts based on how many miles you actually actually drive you can give people immediate credit for being able to through data verify how they're taking care of their vehicle and and give credit for people at the time of turn in because you know that the vehicle's been well maintained and that it's been driven gently uh, through data you can use the fact that customers drive a certain way to give them adjustable insurance products usage based insurance is out there now but you can you can use that information to encourage them to get their repairs done at your store using OEM provided parts and do that at a lower cost by managing the claims when they happen Rivian's actually talked about doing some really interesting stuff in that space through their connectivity you can do an awful lot of over the air repairs which Tesla has been doing pretty pretty uh, prominently because you have a data connection with all your vehicles and you can judge whether or not they can be fixed with a, a data reflash uh, versus coming in to get to get parts redone. Um, you can anticipate when vehicles are going to wear out and you can see how people are driving and use that as a way to understand what they might want to buy next. And mm -hmm. you can use that to suggest uh, both software accessories like new software enabled features that you could send to them or physical accessories based on the places that they're going and the kinds of things that they're doing and use that to inform based on the data you're seeing about how shopping is being done what kinds of vehicles they might be interested in buying and make sure that they're they're made aware that you have them and that you're you've got them configured the way that they want them and uh it's just a reimagining an entire data-based relationship with the customer that's quite a lot different than than what's been done traditionally and is a lot more efficient and ultimately is more pleasing to the customer well, the possibilities seem endless and I love it. And that's one of the I things, so. I mean, I mean, the, the space in and of itself, that's, that's one of the things that I absolutely love about automotive is although it is a, a, a an industry that has withstood the test of time, right? Mm -hmm. We're very resilient folk. We've been around for a while and a lot of people would say, oh, they're slow to adopt technology and things like that, which sure in some instances may be true, but then you see how quickly technology changes and how you can use it to your advantage to, to really make your whole operation better uh, yeah, and, and sure. positively impact your bottom line. So I really love it. I mean, I'm going to stay tuned to, to Motor Minds and, and just tell us a little bit about that because one of the things that I thought fascinating about Motor Minds, so you guys are actually uh, an incubator as well, correct? For, right. Can you just walk us through that? Because I know there's experiment marketers out there, myself included, who have ideas that, oh, for sure. I mean, can they go to you guys to get uh, funding or, or walk us through that a little bit? Well, we uh, mostly what we work with now are established startups. Okay. So what we, we help with most is acceleration. So mm -hmm. because we have good knowledge of automotive and good connections throughout the automotive world and can guide uh, new companies to the automotive space, we can help them grow faster uh, and more efficiently because we, we have a good insight about how things work. So we're always on the lookout for innovative startups that are ready to accelerate their automotive presence. A lot of times we have startups from outside automotive that use mm -hmm. us to enter automotive, or we have some that uh, have been working in automotive, but, but want to go faster and uh, reach, reach higher and we help them go 
go faster uh, that way. So that's a lot of what we're about. Um, considering moving further upstream and getting into uh, uh, the fund kind of space and looking for and into more of an incubator space. But I'd say at this point, we're more focused on uh, solutions that are really ready to grow and ready to accelerate Excellent. with our with our help. Well, very cool. So for anyone listening out there, for watching, if you have a, a startup where you're already in operations, you know, and you want to really grow that business, Motor Minds is the place. Greg is your guy. I know he's got a team right. too, but he's the connected car practice manager over there. So if you loved right. anything that you heard on today's episode, uh, utilizing data, and uh, that may be what your startup does, who knows? Give uh, the folks at Motor Minds a, a call. You can go to motorminds.com. Uh, it's just right. M-O-T-O-R-M-I-N-D-Z.com, motorminds.com. And there are all the information's there. Greg, thank you so very much for coming on today. And, and thank you for your, you know, your forward looking statements on how important uh, connected car will be uh, moving forward in the space. With thank that, you, Colin. Thank you, have, Matt. you have any final thoughts yes. for the dealer community for us to rally together? What, what do you say? Give us a rally and cry. <laughs> Let's get connected. Let's oh. get connected. I love <laughs> right. it. Very, very good. Thank you, Greg, for coming Thanks, Greg. on. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. So did you even know about all that? Your car is basically having a conversation about it and you without you even yeah. knowing about it. It's, it's, I was it's talking, talking to Greg, about you. <laughs> I was talking to Greg about that on an episode of Mostly Automotive Marketing. Yeah. And there are so many opportunities I uh, th I think for dealers and for OEMs and uh, but one thing I'm, I had mentioned on the podcast was I really hope that we and we being you and I and the rest of marketers don't find a way to ruin it because if yeah. there's if there's a group of people that <laughs> that can ruin it it's us yeah but how can you ruin that I think you just need to utilize it I understand you need what to you're saying it, but you know we, you, we you know to, I, it, we need it's to be aware of it. Yeah, it's our human nature to be like, let's send out a push notification that we're going to have free hot dogs oh, and balloons yeah. this Saturday. And like, you got to use it for good, people. Right. No, and end of the month, but I can it see it. Wait, the, the GM says, hey, we need to sell 10 more cars. Uh, how quick, send yeah. out a notification that their car is about to blow up. You know, we, yeah, we know exactly. the connected technology. You need a new one. No, I think I, that I do. I do agree. You're right. There's, you know, Greg talks about all, you know, all these cars are connected. You can, it, so you know, let's utilize. But I think, I think a lot of it, like you said, comes from like the inability to be, okay, well, where do we start? You know, who, who, yeah, who you do know, who do we talk to? What do you do? Who grabs the bull by the horns and right. how do you do it? Yeah, exactly. Right. And there's got to be like this one group. A committee. A company. <laughs> yeah, a committee. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Yeah. Well, awesome, Matt. Thank you so very much. Uh, for everyone, that is another episode of Experiment Marketing. Please like and follow us on Facebook, just our respective podcast titles. You'll find yes. us. Subscribe on YouTube. A lot of great content from previous episodes. Once again, thank you to our sponsors, Dealer Marketing Magazine, dealermarketing.com, and to Greg Ross for being on and telling us all that awesome information. Let's get connected, everybody.